Hello, my name is Luca Politi, and I'm a second year graduate student in the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures at Harvard. I'm joined today by Professor James Turner, who's the James D. Hart Chair of English at the University of California, Berkeley, and who's recently published Eros Visible, Art, Sexuality, and Antiquity in Renaissance Italy. Before I ask you about the book, Professor Turner, I just wanted to thank you for this amazing contribution. Um, I learned a lot reading it, and it was a tremendously enjoying experience for me to read it. Well, I'm delighted that you that you, you found it interesting, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, to, to come here and talk about the book. Thank you. How, how did you organize um, this book? Um, originally, it, it began perhaps as a rather more narrow study of erotica, um, of you know actual depictions of sexual activities in prints and drawings from Renaissance Italy, and that that very soon came to seem a bit too narrow a focus, and so um, I, uh, in the end, decided that um, antiquity was the most important word in the subtitle, and um, I identified certain myths or episodes from antiquity that seemed to generate the most powerful and original thinking about how an artist might represent the body, the excited body, the, uh, the animated and desiring body. And the, two, the most fundamental was the story of Venus, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and her illicit affair with Mars, Ares, the god of war. Um, and how her husband, Vulcan, who is after all the god of metalwork, um, trapped them in a net and uh, displayed them to the gods of Olympus. Uh, demanding punishment for this dreadful act of adultery. Now that is the the oldest of the myths that I study, and it's told in Homer. That's a very ancient myth, and that seems to be sort of the origin of all the idea of displaying, the capturing and displaying the body. And we still say capture for for a powerful visual. The artist, the craftsman, Vulcan, displaying his own shame actually. And then the other episode from antiquity that seemed uh, generative, not just interesting, but productive, was stories of the great um, Praxiteles sculpture of uh, Aphrodite, Venus, on the island of Cnidos. It's really the first nude in Western art, and it was a cult object and people went to visit it. And the stories circulated around this, that it was so beautiful and so powerful, this sculpture, that uh, people fell in love with it. Now, what I found, that these stories came up over and over and over again, both in writing about art in the Renaissance and in uh, the actual subject matter that artists um, had chose. And so the the first half of the book is studies in the Mars, Venus, Vulcan, the triangular relation, Mars, Venus, Vulcan, and the observing audience. And then the second half of the book is uh, is more about this notion of falling in love with the artifact and then recreations of what that might mean, what that might feel. Um, and the, 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 the story, to put it in a nutshell, is that Back in antiquity, it was first of all a story about uh, something shameful. Um, that that you know this this young man falling in, in love with a statue was it was totally inappropriate, and it shows it warns you not to do that. But as the story gets retold, it becomes a story about how wonderful and how powerful art is, and the moral dimension drops out, and the uh, the aesthetic dimension comes to the fore. Um, and then the other twist on the story of falling in love with the Aphrodite, which comes from a very great text of antiquity by uh, Lucian of Samosota. He was, uh, I don't know how well known he is now, but he was certainly regarded as a giant uh, in the Renaissance. And he, discover, he describes how visitors come and, and look at the statue from different points of view and describe their excitement at the statue. and. Because the heterosexual looks at the front and the homosexual looks at the back, and all these complicated 
aspects of sort of bisexuality and desire. And it's a wonderful, wonderful story, and many, many uh, writers were inspired by it in the Renaissance. But the basic shift is how that becomes not a warning, a cautionary tale, but an inspirational tale. So the, the, the second half of the book is about, is about that, essentially. Um. To return to the, the title, Eros Visible, and mm. you said that antiquity is a very key uh, term in, in the subtitle, visible to me seems like a very um, a prominent and important word. Absolutely. Here. Um, and uh, of course, the relation between textuality and literature and visuality is something that's already come up in, in, your, first, in your first answer. Um, could you describe a little bit about how you perceive that relationship working in this context hmm. of eroticism? Yep. yep. Um, the, um, the, for someone in the Judeo-Christian tradition, and after all, these Renaissance patrons and artists um, you know, they were Christian, even though they were profoundly interested in in antiquity. They, um, but there's always an element of shame in nakedness and in uh, in sexuality. There's that that res residue, uh, starting with when Adam and Eve eat the fruit. Their eyes were opened and they saw that they were naked, and then trouble from then then on. Uh, and mentioned already that uh, that the uh, stories about falling in love with the statue and stories about the adultery of of, of um, Mars and Venus were certainly originally thought of as as, as quite shameful. But s some impulse in the Renaissance, in this sort of moment when Eros was was wanted to become visible rather than hidden that both these very powerful sources of shame become um, turned around. They, so um, several thinkers of the time in the Renaissance actually believed that antiquity was a kind of golden age in which uh, we did not experience shame. Um, now, this was partly based on, on certain writings, uh, uh, and also partly based on the fact that what they knew about ancient art was heroic nude sculptures, which were being rediscovered in exactly this period. Uh, so the, the, the illusion or delusion that if you, re, if you could somehow fully re, reconstruct antiquity, you would somehow also be freed from the curse of Adam and Eve, that somehow the naked would become the nude, uh, was a very, very powerful idea. Of course, nobody believed it 100%. But enough artists and enough thinkers believed it to make what I call an erotic revolution in that period. Um, the uh, word shame uh, makes me think about the importance that you attribute to modes of viewership. Um, and the role of the viewer um, who presumably would be looking at these paintings. Um, what kinds of effects were the artists trying to go for? I mean, is it at this point, are you saying that it's at this point a regular kind of expected, you look at a nude and you're not surprised at all? Or is shame one of these emotions that artists are trying to play with? Or is shock perhaps another type of emotion that is intentionally being tried to um, be activated? Or no, obviously, obviously that's a very, yes. a very powerful question. I would actually diminish the shock element. I think there are other periods when perhaps the, um, uh, the you can certainly see um, speculation about um, uh, about the, the as it were, the shock value, um, way back, uh, really very early in the Renaissance in writing. Mm -hmm. And one example that came up um, that I is uh, the, the, the great um, early Renaissance uh, writer Boccaccio speculates about what would happen if Giotto, the, the, the greatest artist of his own period, were to paint uh, a scene from antiquity in which um, a Priapus or some, some god of you know, fertility and a sexual god uh, were, were to be shown actually you know, making a sexual attempt on a nymph or a maiden or something like that. And he says... And, and Boccaccio says uh, there would be no shame in that. That would be that's what artists do. But at the time, the very early Renaissance, no artist ever actually attempted that. But Boccaccio could conceive that as a possibility that, that somehow art uh, gives you a sort of exemption from from shame. He said you wouldn't condemn Giotto for that. 
What was a speculation in the early Renaissance becomes a reality at this moment when somehow uh, all these things came together. Somehow the the, the artist's ability to um, to paint flesh tones, for example, that's something that is is always mentioned by uh, Giorgio Vasari, for example, the great. Um, biographer of the art of the period. He says, um, what we've now discovered how to do is to bring bring flesh to life. And yet, um, we have some unexpected statements um, from figures like Aretino, for example, um, where if you would expect that um, Aretino would be embracing this eroticism that we're talking about, um, then he would... Um, be completely a proponent of Michelangelo's uh, Sistine Chapel and the nudes there. And yet, um, as you point out, um, the reaction is quite the opposite. That's a very interesting case. Pietro Aretino um, was, is the, the, the absolutely central figure who writes about sexuality, who theorizes his, uh, his role in commenting on the famous um, uh, sexual positions in, in, in engravings. And he declares over and over again the legitimacy of desire, uh, the irrationality of shame. He says, why should we hide the, the genitalia? They have made the whole human race. We should, we should wear them as an ornament. We should uh, organize festivals in celebration of them, as they did in antiquity, the phallic festivals of antiquity. His whole life, he's, he's proclaiming this, absolutely. Now, your question is, the same, the same Aretino, when he saw... Michelangelo's Last Judgment, the late work of, 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 of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, um, not these glorious nudes from early in Michelangelo's career, he was deeply shocked at the nudity. And suddenly, the, 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 the great advocate of, of shame, shameless, nude, uh, shameless uh, display of our own celebration of our own sexuality is attacking Michelangelo for being so lewd and so terrible. And so, um, how does this happen? Well, one thing is it could just be part of a sort of soap opera uh, that um, Aretino, who is extremely vain and extremely proud of his friendship with artists such as Titian, he's written to Michelangelo saying, um, hey, can I have a drawing? Like he's trying to he's trying to borrow a, a valuable drawing off him and Michelangelo sort of you know, brushes him off. So part of it is just peak. It's just his vanity has peaked, but also part of it is the sense that of decorum that, that that in a sacred chapel, the kind of nudity that in a secular setting would be fat would be fine. Uh, that that you know, there are still limits. And so in the secular world, um, then then you know the celebration of eros absolutely, but don't do it in. And Aretino even says that uh, my own. The characters I created in my own pornographic writing, even they would have to close their eyes looking at this, looking at these nudes in 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 chapel. Mm -hmm. So part of it is just, um, yes, yes, the sexual revolution, yes, let's celebrate uh, our own sexuality, but in its own place. And yet, um, toward the end of the book, you start to talk about how perhaps Michelangelo in The Last Judgment was inspired by the Imodi engravings, um, or how, how that might have influenced his yeah. own compositions. Absolutely. So there, that hierarchy or, or, or a binary is is not present. Um, Absolutely. And yet well, it seems to be restored with art. Yeah, know? exactly. Yeah. I mean, in keeping with the Sistine Chapel, which is, after all, the most famous um, um, art site of the period, um, that that even even this idea that you know, sacred art is sacred and should be very proper and the f figures should be draped, and secular art, you can celebrate the body. That's too simple. That's what, that's what Aretino falls into, just as a way to sort of stick it to Michelangelo. But it, Michelangelo himself has borrowed figures from... Uh, you, uh, um, you mentioned the modi, and these are the, that's the term we tend to use. It means the ways. These are the, the famous... Uh, images of of of, um, of 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 different modes of sexual intercourse, all of which, of course, were forbidden by the church. Um, that that in those designs, uh, the artists of, of 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 those designs had borrowed figures from Michelangelo's nude studies. Michelangelo then, as it were, says, "Well, I can play at that game too," and he actually borrows back 
figures that had been completely sexualized mm. and turns them into the angels and the heroic, the, the, the souls of the blessed. Well, the book contains many um, new and interesting findings, um, as well as it, um, to, you know, um, the, the, one of the, you know, your, your identification of perhaps um, uh, the, one of the Emodi engravings being um, taken as a kind of, like, as a Mars, Vulcan, Venus episode, perhaps, or um, being inspired or somehow related and not just a simple person to person, um, but actually mythological. Um, Absolutely. Uh, and also the the um, external facade of the Villa Kiji, which is the Farnesina, um, where would you like to say a word about um, that um, reconstruction that you? Mm, yes, that's right. The, the um, um, I mean, the other, perhaps the most canonical and famous and much much visited Renaissance site, uh, a building in which a frescoed building after the Sistine Chapel would be the, the Farnesina in Rome, which is a secular villa by the, the great banker. Uh, Agostino Chigi, and that's a sort of quintessence of, the, of as were the secular space. In fact, uh, the people who later, the theorists who were attacking Michelangelo, and it wasn't just Aretino, it was everybody, for violating decorum in the Sistine Chapel, said, this kind of poetry, po poetic invention is fine. Look at the Villa Farnesina. It's good there, you see. Um, so part of the detective work that I did was to uh, uh, picking up on uh, some uh, mention that this villa, which has these beautiful frescoes by Raphael and uh, Peruzzi on the interior, was painted on the outside as well. Mm -hmm. That the whole architecture was uh, alive with figures. Mm -hmm. And I was able to show, and, you know, building on other scholars, but going a bit further, that the outside of this building was emblazoned with, um, with, uh, with paintings of the loves of the gods, uh, uh, with Mars and Venus as the central. Uh, and this, the happy embrace of Mars and Venus and then Vulcan getting ready to spring his trap and so on. Th this had become so much part of the, of the thinking of the period that it could be placed even on the outside of the villa so that visitors would come and from the very moment of stepping into the courtyard they would say, this is the realm of Venus, this is the palace of Venus. Uh, and that, that would be my main example of the acceptability right. of what in a previous generation would have been thought of as utterly, utterly unacceptable. Yes. Well, this book contains many interesting um, uh, facts and uh, arguments. Um, and uh, congratulations again. It was a true pleasure to read it and to talk with you today. Thank you. And thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me.